Salutations everyone and welcome to Tier Nero, the last days of Europe in which we are looking at a small bit of content for President George McGovern, his inaugural address. Friends, today is a momentous day in American history. Two centuries ago, our nation's birth was a milestone in the long conquest for freedom, but the beautiful, bold dream that our forefathers fought for has yet to reach its consummation. Today, rather than set forth a new dream, I urge the old dream on. The old dream that I too have cried out for all my political career. I cry for the more the simple freedom to act, to speak, and be happy. I cry for freedom from the conflict that we embroil ourselves in time and time again. For the majority of our great country's history, we've been in conflict with nations both foreign and civil. Well, I say that that no longer shall we fight, no longer shall we enslave ourselves to the sword. Going forward, our swords shall be hammered back into plowshares. America, I ask you to look deep inside your hearts and truly realize the spiritual and emotional revolution this country is about to embark upon. No more saber-rattling with foreign powers, no more annual threats of annihilation. No, America, I say unto you that part of history is that part of history is finished. Now comes the time for peace and reconciliation with those or with whom those whom we have wronged and those who have wronged us. I have been given a great responsibility to shepherd our great nation into such an era, and it is not one that I accept lightly, nor is it a burden that I can carry alone. It is my belief that this administration should incorporate the wisest and most peaceable of individuals as well as the most modest that such that an understanding between all may be achieved. I promise this America and more. Hail to the chief. And there he is, George McGovern. A better world is possible. It must be. <clears throat> With a very strong message of peace. A new League of Nations and reopen trade with America's enemies. Very cool. The McGovern Presidency. The new face of the Republican Democrats is none other than one George Stanley McGovern of South Dakota. Running on a platform of military de-escalation and divesting funds from the military to a more civilian initiative, initiatives, President McGovern represents a significant departure from the politics of the 60s. Rather than continue to push America's position as a global military power, he will instead work to build up our country as a bastion of peace, prosperity, and diplomacy that will work to solve the world's problems with words rather than with weapons. The governor will first need to secure the support necessary to roll back the military adventurism of the last 10 years. A tough sell in a country so dedicated to being the world's last bastion of democracy. But a sell he is more than determined to close. Once the hawks have been reined in and their budget reduced, the government will use the funds to shore up the failures of American society in the hopes of maintaining our country's highest standards of living and beating back the rhetoric of any extremists who would seek to undo us. Many question. If a diplomatic approach is viable or even moral in a world filled with the enemies of democracy, the NPP in particular, have already decried the potential of uh, friendly overtures to Japan, but for President McGovern, there's no other possible path. Every day we continue down the road to warfare is one more tick for the doomsday clock. Every dollar spent on more bullets is a dollar not spent on helping good, honest Americans. It is time to rethink our priorities and begin a new legacy for the good of all mankind. We get political power and the hill of Arlington. Very cool. I'll be honest, this picture here, I don't think it really flatters him that much. Uh, it looks okay, at least in, at least in my opinion. But he, I don't know, he just looks okay. Regardless, uh, to get to McGovern, I'll be honest, I can't remember the time of this recording. We start with Tricky Dick. Did I think I went? No, no, uh, Tricky Dick. Yeah, you start off with Nixon, of course. I, you know, I'll be honest, I can't remember which way I'm going because I've played so many presidents so far, so I can't remember how I got McGovern. Regardless. I think it was through Margaret Chase Smith, though. But, the hills of Arlington. The power to destroy the world is the only guarantee of peace, Mr. President. Eternal vigilance is the price we pay for our way of life. The words on the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff weighed heavily on President George McGovern and Vice President Bob Dole, pressing them deeper into the limousine seats. The briefing on the nuclear arsenal had ripped away any lingering exuberance from the inauguration, leaving the two speechless from the terrifying power invested into them. McGovern uttered four words to the driver, Take us to Arlington. As the two walked up a hill, Overlooking the roads of white head stones, McGovern turned to Dole. All this talk about how nuclear weapons ensure peace, and I can't stop thinking about the men who still never came home. Dole sighed. A lot of people still say defending South Africa was right, George, that we can't win the Cold War in defense. I won't throw a fight that the Germans or Japanese start McGovern's countered as they crest the hill, but if winning the Cold War means digging acres of new graves here, and if they still think you're wrong, look at Germany, McGovern said darkly. Two decades of war left them a society rotting from the inside out. We can't do that to America. War will end us before it ends our enemies. And we've got reorganized stuff. There's no time for celebration. Inauguration and general fanfare aside, President McGovern does not have the luxury of resting on his laurels and basking in his victory. In every presidency, it is said that the first hundred days are the most crucial, setting the agenda determining the success of the rest of the term. Thus, there's not a moment to lose. It is time to push forward with the most 
pressing legislative priorities to lay the groundwork for the coming four years. President McGovern intends to give a speech before Congress, detailing his plans for the century in a far more formal manner than his promises on the campaign trail. Once both the party and the opposition have a clear idea of what our aims are, we can begin taking the necessary steps to pass legislation and get this presidency off to a promising start. Cool. Yeah, I think I'll, they'd get to Margaret Chase Smith to get McGovern, yeah. So I'm getting my, this run confused to get McGovern. I'm getting confused with um, my next run, so my apologies. But regardless, no time for celebration. The poor. Ours may be the strong or the greatest, strongest nation on earth, but how can we claim that moral high ground in spreading liberty and prosperity abroad when we cannot do so at home? While America spends billions on new military technology and funding foreign insurgencies, many of our own people are struggling to make ends meet. The economic disruption of the oil crisis only furthered the woes of our most impoverished citizens. There's never been a more crucial time in a country's history to put the poorest first. There are so many better places America's money could be going yet than yet to more bullets and ordinance. President McGovern will speak clearly on what he means to do to help those among us who need it. More support for welfare programs, stimulus packages for deprived communities, increased funding for infrastructure and development that will provide blue-collar jobs, all this and more must be considered if we are to ensure America stays a land of opportunity for all. <clears throat> From swords to plowshares. The house chamber was filled to the brim as President McGovern strode to the podium. There were scattered cheers and applause. Many of the students in attendance had volunteered for McGovern's election campaign. My fellow Americans, McGovern smiled. It came easily in a comfortable territory, surrounded by supporters, and would play well to the other audience, sitting in their living rooms across America. A country's strength is measured by more than soldiers and nuclear weaponry. For every soldier deployed abroad, there are ten Americans, workers and farmers, young and old, black and white, who support them, and they will be called upon to replace the men who never come home. McGovern gripped the sides of the podium as he hit his stride. We cannot neglect America's responsibility as the last light of liberty in this world. But Americans have a right to ask, do we neglect our nation at home, its communities, and its peoples by fighting wars of choice abroad or even as the oil crisis continues? Would we not be better served by turning swords to plowshares, to welcome our weary soldiers home from endless war, and to entrust a fairer, prosperous America to our children? <clears throat> Scattered applause rose from the audience as McGovern pressed his point home. America has decided that it has had enough of the sacrifice and liberty in the name of security of foreign entanglements without end. A prosperous and just America is a better guarantee of the free world than a garrison state. Our work begins today. Today. <clears throat> a new food for peace. The Ba'athist insurrections and the ensuing oil crisis brought chaos to the Middle East. Amidst the carnage, ordinary life amongst the people have been broken down, and supplies of food, water, medicine have become scarce in areas affected by the fighting. When people are desperate, terrible things can happen. If the region continues down its current path of instability, further conflict is certain. Conflict that could ultimately pull in America and other powers that have devastating consequences for the world. Now is the time for America to take the initiative in world affairs, not through more warfare, but instead by promoting peace. In the 50s, President Eisenhower created the Office of Food for Peace, <clears throat> an organization dedicated to exporting agricultural products to struggling nations around the world. The last few administrations have left it to fall to the wayside, however. Now President McGovern sees great promise in this forgotten initiative and has vowed to completely revitalize it as a tool for helping the struggling lands of the Middle East. Food is strength and food is peace, and food is freedom and food is a helping hand at people around the world whose goodwill and friendship we want. No more will we solve every problem with guns and bullets, instead we will work to fill the bellies of the world. <clears throat> the public has become less popular, the far right grows more popular, Democrats look a little better, and okay, cool. Cool. The Senate of South Dakota. Not much a change in the fields of Toddville, Iowa. Presidents came and went in far away Washington, but few legislators ever came to visit. Those who did had all said the same thing, that things would be better, that life would change, and it would never really had, even as the children moved away or joined the army never to return. The few had any expectations that President McGovern would be any different. Sure, he was from South Dakota, son of the Great Plains, like themselves, but that was it. The residents of Toddville were sure that they hear the same hackneyed platitudes and calls to sacrifice that inevitably fall in the communities of rural America. What does it mean to be an American in the Midwest today? The president's voice carried through the sporadic static. Our communities and families in the plains are asked to give their sons and crops to serve America, and what have they received in return? A visit by, <clears throat> a visit or two by Washington politicians every two years, even as funds and jobs dry up in favor of the coasts, the listening residents nodded quietly. At least someone knew how they felt. The people of my home state and across the plains in the Southwest are hearty, God-fearing, patriotic people. They deserve the same dignity as any other American, and under my administration, they will not be ignored. Fly over country no longer. Cool. And, ar and the armed. <clears throat> Regardless of one's thoughts on war, cannot be denied that those who fight them have 
who fight them have historically been given the short end of the stick. Millions of men have been sent overseas, figuratively thrown at their enemies in the hope of holding them back with their bodies. Many of these men did not return home. Many came back with a few limbs shorter or with broken spirits. <clears throat> what in the end was a reward? A medal, a handshake, and a kick out the back door. In short, active soldiers are expected to serve without complaint, while wounded veterans are sent home and forgotten about. President McGovern wishes to outline his plans to support the troops, even if he's even as he prepares to scale back the military. Better standards for active duty soldiers, support and compensation for wounded veterans, and a much needed update to the rules of engagement are all on the table. Not only will this help appease the Hawks who view our plans as an affront to the military, it help us ease in our plans to begin scaling back the military altogether in the name of the human dignity and the betterment of our people. The USA Freedom Act will be introduced. Interesting. <clears throat> and we remove some military factories. Alright, whatever. Yeah. Cool. Let's see, get some sonar, because sonars are cool. And then maybe grab some submarinos. There we go. And beyond. Begin the withdrawals. USA Freedom Act, uniting and strengthening America by funding restored energy and economic development over Militarism Act. Jesus, that's really long. As President McGovern's flagship policy, the act proposes the first re-education or reduction of the U.S. military budget in decades. A, prop a proposition that is understandably license or incense the more hawkish residents of the Capitol Hill. Development will be wound down, recruitment numbers will be reduced, and a significant amount of American troops stationed in, abroad and per, partner nations will be called back home and demobilized. The purpose of all this is simple. The money saved by slash in the military budget will instead be diverted to the civilian budget. Initiatives for aiding the poor will be bumped up. Much needed infrastructural development will be brought forward. Education, housing, health care, and other crucial areas will see a windfall unlike anything they've seen in a generation. No longer will we throw all of our money at killing people. Instead, we will invest in the well-being and the future of the nation. <clears throat> Passing this act will be crucial for President McGovern to begin the process of leading America to a brighter future. The failure could undermine the entire mandate of his presidency. It's time to pull out all the stops to prove that the peace really does stand a chance in the world. Death Supreme Court Justice, well that's nice. And introducing the USA Freedom Act. Today, the McGovern administration's first piece of major leg legislation, the USA Freedom Act, enters debate on Capitol Hill. The bill, a back acronym for the <clears throat> United and Strengthening America by Funding Restored Energy and Economic Development Over Militarism <clears throat> Act of, of 1973, is an ominous bill that, broadly speaking, pri reprioritizes federal spending away from the military towards domestic projects necessary to revitalize the American economy in the wake of the oil crisis disruption. The bill is attracting no small share of detractors who call it a drastic and unprepared move towards American isolationism against the ever-present threat of Germany and Japan. The McGovern administrations remain unmoved by the criticism, besides noting that the American people gave them a mandate to pursue nation-building at home instead of conflict abroad, and that Congress flirts with ignoring the will of the people at its peril. <coughs> The Freedom Act is a momentous piece of legislation that carries significant implications for the future of American foreign and domestic policy, and its fate now lies in the hands of the congressmen assembled in Capitol Hill. Let's get the votes. You know, I'm cool with demobilizing already, but we've got two divisions, man. How much more can we really demobilize? I've already slashed on the military budget. Actually, if you look at that, we're already spending, like, what was it, eight times military spending on civilian spending, so... We're going to continue slashing the budget, but at some point, there ain't going to be too much to slash, right? And we shall make our presence known. America's new path aims down the road to peace. That road will be long and a hard one. It'll take the best efforts of the brightest diplomats this nation has to offer. It'll be filled with challenges and perils, but whatever the hurdles, we must be willing to face them for the future of our country and for all mankind. The main hurdle of the road to peace is that it cannot be walked alone. When one looks across the sea, it seems an impossible road to walk. Japan, her belly blowed with a looted wealth of countless nations. <coughs> Germany, her hands stained with the blood of so many innocents. How many could we possibly? How could we find peace with these nations? Why would we want peace with these nations? In the name of peace, we must at least be willing to try. Even if they are not willing to listen, we must make our intent clear to our rivals. We are done endlessly clashing over petty ideology or territory. We are fed up to the ears of the old men dreaming up wars for young men to die in. If we make it clear that we are willing to listen, then there might even be the slightest chance that they will be willing to talk. No more will we raise a sword. It's time to offer the olive branch. The USA Freedom Act fails. The result of the final vote in the Senate are in, and the McGovern administration swallows an embarrassing defeat in Congress as the USA Freedom Act failed to secure enough votes for its passage. Despite a popular mandate for the American people to reduce America's overseas commitments and involvement in foreign po conflicts, vocal opposition from the traditional foreign policy community, and the military stirred up enough senators or legislators to vote against the legislation. Congress is now seeking continued legislation for extending previous spending levels into the next year, leaving military spending levels and troop deployments authorizations untouched. Even as President McGovern and his aides regroup after the setback, OFN ambassadors in Washington 
Washington privately reported that relief that the most radical provisions of the USA Freedom Act, namely its proposals to begin select withdrawal of American troops from overseas, were rejected in Congress. The Australians, most notably, have relied on a robust U.S. presence to bolster the position on the doorstep of the co-prosperity sphere for decades, and the ambassador publicly expressed their desire to reaffirm USA Australian defense agreements or arrangements in the aftermath of the act's failure. There has got to be some other way in which I will show you the successful way. All right, and actually, the USA Freedom Act passed as the results of the final vote in the Senate are in, and the McGovern administration has seen its first successful bill safely through Congress into the president's desk. Despite the objections of the traditional foreign policy community in the military, Congress has authorized the USA Freedom Act budget allocations affected from 73 onwards. The Pentagon's budget has been cut for the first time in over two decades, and federal administrators are launching assessments into a new batch of social programs to be funded with reallocated spending. More contentious will be the ne new negotiations between the U.S. and its allies in the OFN about defense and troop commitments. Although the USA Freedom Act calls on the McGovern administration to reduce troop deployments overseas, the measure is likely to meet significant pushback from OFN member nations. Most notably, Australia sitting on the doorstep of the co-prosperity sphere. We'll do with that as it as we come to it. Cool. And I've already read this, but let's, we can go ahead and read this again. Why not? Uh, so America's new path aims down a road to peace. That road will be a long and hard one. It will take the best efforts of the brightest diplomats this nation has to offer. It will be filled with shit. Champagne? Well, challenge and perils, not champagne. But whatever the hurdles, we must be willing to face them for the future of the country and for all of mankind. The main hurdle of the road to peace is that it cannot be walked alone. When one looks across the sea, it seems an impossible walk road to walk. Japan are barely bloated with the looted wealth of the countless nations. Germany are hands sustained or stained with the blood of so many innocents. How could we possibly find peace with these nations? Why could, would we want peace with these nations? In the name of peace, we must at least be willing to try. Even if they are not willing to listen, we must make our intent clear to our rivals. We're done endlessly clashing over petty ideology or territory. We're fed up to the ears of the old men dreaming up wars for young men to die in. If we make it clear that we are willing to listen, then there might be even the slightest chance that we'll be willing to talk. No more will we raise the sword. It'll be time to offer the olive branch. And I know I read that earlier, but eh, it's okay. Why not? I guess... Let's see. Anything here? Really important APC turrets. Researching more military stuff even though we're committed to demobilization and more social spending. And I'll see the last event. Make our presence known, and the first step. The Oval Office rumbled with activity as the TV crews prepared for President McGovern's live address. Vice President Dole, Secretary of State Lodge, and President McGovern held behind the desk, hurriedly going over any loose ends. Is everyone at State and Defense ready? McGovern asked quietly. Once this ends, we need to hit the ground running. Send peace feelers out to the Japanese and Germans, reassurances to the Canadians and the Australians. Lodge not nodded. All of our embassies are going to go on your word, Mr. President. The three read through the familiar lines of the speech, thinking of other things. We can't be sure of how the German, Germania and Tokyo will react, McGovern said, rubbing his eyes nervously. What happens if we're left stuck in the cold? Dole leaned forward. You're right. We don't know if the Germans or Japanese will play ball, but the American people want a more peaceful world, and we owe it to them to try. If it doesn't work out, we can make sure the Germans and the Japanese are kept busy with the Middle East. While well, we focus on domestic policy, Lodge added, they need the oil. We have Texas. And Alaska. And California. The film crew cried for quiet, and the president looked into the cameras as the lights came on, burning away the shadows in the Oval Office. We dare to dream of a better world, but unfortunately, that's all the content that we do have for President George McGovern. Hope you enjoyed this little video. If you did, consider leaving a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you all tomorrow in a different video. Thanks for watching. Have a great, peaceful rest of your day.